Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello team, welcome to Comic Commentary, tie-in issues 16 and 17. In this series, we'll be reviewing the Young Justice tie-in comics that folded directly into the story arcs of the animated series. My name is Rich, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Emily. Hi, everybody. In Comic Commentary, we will be discussing how the tie-in comics relate to the video game, the first two seasons of Young Justice, and the broader DC universe. But unlike our regular review episodes, we won't be having a Crashing the Mode segment, so consider this your spoiler warning. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com, on the YJFiles.tumblr.com, at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com, and now at crashingthemode.com slash YouTube. And with all that out of the way, send it back to Emily for Hello, Megan. Today we are talking about uh, issues 16 and 17 titled Common Denominators and Uncommon Dominators, <laughs> which were released on May 30th and June 20th of 2012, respectively. The timestamps for these issues are September 6th through 7th and 11th through 12th. And the episode tie-in for these issues is that Kid Flash's segment in the first one of these two issues takes place on the same day as Target's, and the whole arc takes place just a few days before Terrors. Uh, the writers for this issue, these two issues, were Greg Weissman and Kevin Hopps, penciler Christopher Jones, inker also Christopher Jones, colors Zach Atkison, and letterer Desi Cienti. The old gang is back. Just in time for your next mission. So the establishing shot for this issue is that we open with Artemis and Green Arrow outside the Star City World History Museum, where an alarm has just been bypassed and a barred window has been cut through. Inside, they confront a group of thieves dressed in dark clothing, but they are outnumbered and the thieves get away with a snake-themed dagger. During the fight, though, Artemis covers one of the thieves with oil, which contains microbead trackers so that our heroes can find them later. We next cut to the Flash and Kid Flash as they're rounding up animals that have apparently escaped from the Central City Zoo. During the cleanup, the Flash uses the powers of his vastly underutilized secret identity and Kid Flash's tech goggles to discover that Venom was taken from the zoo's reptile lab by someone with huge feet covered in a pollen Wally's never seen before. Because, you know, he's like all teenage which boys. They just look at pollen. <laughs> makes you wonder... It just makes you wonder. I got nothing else. Like, okay. Yeah. I, I've never seen this kind of pollen before. I, uh, How many okay. Yes, that tracks. But also, are you implying <laughs> like you have a vast repertoire of pollen knowledge? Like, holy cow. Anyway. We then cut over to the Gotham City Observatory, where Batman and Robin are confronting another set of dark-clad infiltrators, these ones attempting to kidnap the elite astronomer, Dr. Jason Burr. Most of the villains are stopped by the dynamic duo, but with one exception, they all take their own lives using cyanide. The only one left alive afterwards is then interrogated by Batman. Then we jump to uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> okay. Just because. Where Greek... Yeah, you know, it's stuff happens everywhere. <laughs> Where Green Arrow, Artemis, The Flash, Kid Flash, Batman, and Robin have all arrived following different sets of clues. They then converge on a New Age monastery recently purchased by a Jeffrey Burr, twin brother of the kidnapped Dr. Jason Burr, and also known as Cobra. Hashtag see episode four drop zone. Yep. Our next issue starts with a case notes recap from Robin and then dives directly into our heroes attempting to stop Cobra from sacrificing his twin brother using the stolen venom and dagger. The twist is that Cobra doesn't actually want to kill his brother. He simply wants his blood to mutate a Cobra into a monstrous servant, apparently. Or so we're led to think. <laughs> yeah, it was just a very strange thing. It was like, oh, he wants to kill him. Oh, wait, I don't think he does want to kill Oh, wait, no, 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 he definitely he wants does. to kill him. Oh, okay, never mind. He just needed a few drops for the snake. It's I'm a, not quite sure. It's a plot twist within a plot twist. It's not really a plot twist. <laughs> it's, it's not really a plot twist. Um, <laughs> Green Arrow, the Flash and Batman fight the now giant monstrous Cobra. Uh, Artemis, Kid Flash, and Robin are assigned to protect Dr. Burr. 
Unfortunately, while they are dealing with Cobra's minions, Cobra drinks both the venom and his brother's blood, then uses the dagger to kill Dr. Burr, a court, sort of, <laughs> apparently absorbing his soul and body into the dagger. The ritual complete, Cobra declares, I am now the god I was always fated to be, as he mutates into a uh, huge naga, like snake-like humanoid from Asian myth. The design was very cool. Good job, Chris, if that was you. You know, as as one does, just mutates into a giant snake, as one does. Now you know. While Batman, Green Arrow, and The Flash take down the giant cobra outside, Kid Flash comes up with a plan. Robin distracts Cobra while Artemis and Kid Flash grab the dagger. Then Kid Flash and Robin draw the attention of the newly minted god, while Artemis, who has strapped the dagger to an arrow, fires it into his heart, returning Cobra to his normal villainous form and freeing his brother from the dagger. Winning the day for everybody. Well, all the good Yay. people. All the good people succeed. All, all the bad people are punished. People go to Bell Rev. Cycle continues. Stab through, stab through the heart, right? <laughs> stab through the heart doesn't die; just goes right. back to normal. Right. Only only vampires die when you stab them through the heart, Emma. Yeah, you know that's what, that's how that works. Medically speaking, I'm speaking as a professional here. You know, only way to ki- only way to kill a vampire: stab it in the heart. That kills most things. It kills kills quite a bit, unless they got more than one, maybe, which some things do. But we're not going to get into that. Let's dive into some master. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So we mentioned at the top of this that we think Artemis is a smart gal. And I really did love seeing her use the uh, the tracker arrow in this because it's pre-insecurity where we see it in the show for like, that's the main time it's used when they have to track Cheshire. Mm-hmm. But it just makes me smile. I love seeing how these kids get new skills and implement new skills and impress their mentors and that just made me smile reading that yeah i like that i like that green arrow was using yeah the specific tracker trick and then artemis is like so i did what you did but i did it better (laughs) yeah yeah because that's how artemis rolls right and also i made a mess Uh, yeah also how artemis rolls (laughs) <laughs> uh, this issue, the first issue, issue 16, you know, 16s are important in Young Justice, pointing that out, even though we eventually had to have a 16th issue, just point it out. Also establishes or confirms or something acknowledges that the Flash is faster and can outrun and lap Kid Flash. And we established that early so that we can do that thing in season two that makes everyone cry. <laughs> and it's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair at all. Literally, it should yeah. it should not have made me sad to read issue sixteen and just have a couple of panels where Flash is like, "Sorry, buddy, I know you get mad that I can lap you, but it's fine. We need to get this done fast." And I'm just over here like, "No." Remember this moment. Remember this. Mm-hmm. And also breaking down these three little mini missions in the first first half of this arc. I also love that the first few few pages of robin and batman's mission uh is done without any dialogue because it just it establishes like the other two pairs they have to keep talking and running their plan by each other and these two they just go in and they get it done and they're just so in tune and it's great i love it yeah but also with the batman and robin mission i'm gonna point out again that while the comics were largely marketed at a much younger audience than the TV show, they also contain way more death than the show ever did. Yeah, mass suicide's a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> like these <laughs> these comics were on the the kids' shelf at my local comic book store in between like My Little Pony and like Archie. Like these these were not aimed as like everybody dies, but yet every other issue, multiple people die in not great ways. <laughs> and small complaint with with this issue, small complaint with issue 16, but an important one to point out is they they set up this issue to be very much following the rule of three throughout it because they break it down into three missions. They're three different mentor and sidekick pairs. They're mirroring each other, all leading to the same goal. And then they break the rule of three at the exact point where it's kind of important. So they set up the rule of three throughout this whole thing. And then they don't 
follow through with the one really specific parallel that they do that both Artemis and Kid Flash's missions end with them doing something, their mentor complimenting them and them responding with, well, I have a great teacher. And it's a very cute little thing. And if they'd only done it with one or the other of them, I wouldn't have said it was a mistake. But they do it with both of them and then they don't do it with Robin. So it feels Mm. awkward and weird because you read through the whole Robin thing and I'm reading through and I'm like, oh, we're going to get to the end and he's going to do something that impresses his mentor and he gets to say the thing. It creates a great little parallel. Awesome. And then they don't do it, which is just weird and feels weird. Mm -hmm. And I'm just pointing it out. Uh, I know. I think it's a really good observation. Can you can you talk a little about what I mean, you kind of implied what the rule of three was, but. Okay. Um, The rule of three for people who don't know in writing and a lot of the time in acting and in improv is the idea that if a joke, largely generally a joke, but kind of any thematic element works best if you repeat it three times and have a lead up to it. You have you say it once, you establish it, you say it again, that builds on it. Then you say it a third time and that is your big punchline or your big payoff for whatever Mm -hmm. the joke is. Anyone who listened to my appearance on She's a Super Geek will have heard us briefly talk about it, where we had an ongoing thing that was mentors telling their their whoever they were in charge of to to stay behind. I know you think you can handle this, but you need to stay safe. That went from someone telling a mentor telling their sidekick, a sidekick telling their dog, and then an alien telling her spaceship. So it was just building on itself until it got to the most ridiculous point. And so Mm -hmm. in this case, if you did it with Artemis and you did it with Kid Flash, then you should have done it with Robin and they and they didn't bother to do it. And like, I get it. I get I understand that like, well, that's not the relationship Batman and Robin have. That's not something they'd say. I'm like, okay, but you needed to figure out a way to make it work or you needed to take out one of the other ones, because if you don't, it feels awkward to a reader who's expecting it. And it also on some level diminishes robin's role in in the mission that him and batman are on because in both Mm -hmm. of the other cases they have a moment where the sidekick does something that impresses their mentor that shows how important they are to making this happen and robin doesn't get that moment so it feels weird right i'm trying to feel about think about how i feel about that because i kind of see this idea that Batman and Robin have been doing it for a long time. Like, as the writer part of me is like, I totally, I'm feeling you. And as the Robin fan, I'm also feeling you. And then I'm also like, wow, would Batman really do that? Like, how would he do that? And how would it get across? And I feel like you, I feel like they could have found a way to do it. Yeah. And though I don't refer to it specifically as the rule of three, I do discuss kind of that concept. I think it was in the episode... I think it was in the episode where Zatanna puts on the helmet of fate because the rule three applied with the fate helmet. So it started with Wally and then it went to uh, Aqualad and then it ended up with Zatanna. Yes. So um, it kind of applies there where you built you where you where you drop something, you like mention something or talk about something. And then like halfway through your novel, you bring it up again. Yeah at some point in some context and then you know that establishes enough of its existence so that when you get to a finale there are some peak where you're using it wherever that happens to be the reader has enough of this object or this thing in their head to be able to take the take the emotional roller coaster ride i abs- i absolutely agree and it just it was one of those things where i was like oh, I see exactly where you're going. You have set up all the pins. Now you just have to knock them down. Yeah. And then they just kind of walked away from they it. And I'm one. like, oh, right. wait, wait, go back. Right. <laughs> you need two more lines of dialogue that you forgot. <laughs> right. right. And it's a nice. small thing, but it like stuck out to me. as like No, it's something to point out because sometimes we recognize these things subconsciously. Like you're reading a story and you're like, something fell off and I couldn't figure out what that was. You know, like there was some lack of symmetry or some lack of establishment of something like something happened at the end but i just feel like felt weird and out of left field and i don't know why and it's be you know you go back and you think about it and you're like oh well because this didn't get established yeah or maybe something got established earlier in the movie and then never got followed through on or something got established in a previous movie or book or novel and you're just waiting for 
you know, like we were told X was, you know, happened. We were given these clues or given this information or whatever it happens to be. And then in the next movie novel episode that it seems applicable, you're like, wait, what happened to the stuff you showed me? Why was I watching that? Yeah. <laughs> like, why did you show me that? Yeah. <laughs> if, if it wasn't important, don't show it to me. Like, you know, that kind of thing. So especially because this issue is so set up to be three parallel storylines that all right. converge. Like <laughs> right. the cover of this <laughs> right. issue is heroes and mentors and shows all three of them in similar right. situations. Like we are supposed to be drawing this parallel and then they didn't follow through on actually having the line of dialogue that is the concrete parallel mm -hmm. line of dialogue for each pair. I was trying to think if there was maybe some way that you could do it without there being dialogue with Robin and Batman. Like, if there had, because him saying, like, you know, good job or whatever, but him doing it in his own way somehow would have been really cool. You know, like maybe just, I don't even know, I hate to say like a little smile on his face or like a little, that just seems weird. Like, it seems but weird. Like, but the thing is, it doesn't seem weird for Young Justice as Batman. Like, it does a little, a well, little bit, it, yeah, but comparative it does a little to bit. like I get other it. versions of Batman. If YJ, if YJ Batman smiled, I'd be like, "Oh yeah, that's that makes sense. I understand." That's interesting. See, I wouldn't get. I the only time I remember seeing him smile ish, yeah, is when he's playing basketball with Robin and he's kind of mocking himself. He's like mocking their relationship. You know, we're like, think of it as hand-eye coordination training or whatever. And then he's got a little smile on his face, like he's kind of messing. And then Robin gets all happy. But, I mean, like, part of the point of having a Robin is that because Batman is so, you know, stoic and he needs Robin to remind him to be human, right? That's part of the yeah. part of the thing. So, yeah. Anyway, just an interesting thought thought experiment to think about, like, how you could do it where it's doing the same thing, but in the character, staying in character for the person that you're writing about. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was a good observation. I actually didn't notice that. So <laughs> I was just I'm I, I was, was very really cool I was aware of it. No. Like by the second yeah. by the time Kid Flash says it, I'm like, oh, we're gonna have everybody say it. And then I'm like, oh right. or not? Okay. Or not. Or That's not. weird, right. but sure. Strange. Right. But going from that little little writing advice and criticism to <laughs> a little mini canary debrief. Mini canary debrief in the middle of all this. In issue seventeen, I like that they come up with a really good excuse to split the group up. They, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, because like if they had kept everyone together, the mission would have felt like there were no stakes on some level. Because right. the second you pair, like you have all three of these sidekicks along with all three of their mentors, like no matter what you throw them up against, we're just going to be like, oh, they can take it. They can take whatever. They're fine. But they right. find a reason to give all three of our teen sidekicks agency in the situation and like this is what you need to do and the adults aren't going to be there to save you so you guys better be on top of this right. while still having like a legit reason that isn't like we knocked out all of the adults because we couldn't think of what to do with them it's just right. give them a bigger threat <laughs> and they'll go or we put them on that. another plane of existence <laughs> your, your dad is on another earth take care of it right right but yeah, I really, I really appreciate that we got to like see and got to see these parallel forms of teamwork and how they how they come up with how they're doing stuff, which was great. Uh, but this issue is also half of the reason why the love triangle relationship between uh, Robin, Kid Flash, and Artemis is known among fans as museum heist because, uh, for one, the fact that they have this largely involves all three groups of those characters going to museums and preventing things from being stolen. Uh, but it's also because their names, when you mash them together, become Rob Wall Art. And it's a really dumb pun, but it's fun. <laughs> oh, man. I remember you telling me about Wall Art back in our, like the first time you came on the show. That was cracking me up. But when you when you add Rob, Rob to that dynamic. Wall Art. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Wow. And then their their three person team up mission involves multiple museums. Museum mine. But yeah. When you wrote that in the the outline I was like it's half the reason. Why is it not the entire reason? How could it only be half the reason? I'm thinking like because did they do something puns. else in the show or be yeah, because puns. Ouch. Cuz puns are Wow. Puns can be fun. Rob Wall art. Yeah. Okay. But <laughs> I have I have nothing. 
I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> so moving on to a different <laughs> to a different ship. Uh, this issue, the the second half of this arc, uh, issue seventeen, has some great little Spitfire moments that just that just make me smile. That include uh, <laughs> that include Kid Flash trying to be like says to the mentors as they go, he's like, kids, we're not kids. And Artemis just cuts him off to say, says Kid Flash. (laughs) And they have this moment where they both just like smirk and glare at each other at the same time. And Robin cuts in to just be like, can you two not right now? Can you you stop flirting? Can we we break up your most recent romantic moment or something like that? It's like, I hate hate to break this little thing up, but like there's a snake that we need to fight. (laughs) Right. Right, and also the guy we're supposed to protect is, is dead. dead. He's gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. All right. We had Whoops. one job and we failed. We had one. You had one job. Uh, we also in this issue get a little thing that I called out in my super sweethearts, and if you're like, yeah. wait, when does I noticed that happen? It when I was More reading it, this stuff. happens in this issue. Wally Bridal carries Artemis, and it's real cute. And it makes me smile, and they have this little team up moment that just makes me really happy because this is still early uh-huh. them where they're still fighting, uh, but it's real cute. And then after he explains his plan, she calls him Mister Science, right. and he responds with "Just be ready, Miss Thing." She's like, "Oh, I'm always ready, kid." And they just have this great little back and forth moment that makes me so happy. I just yeah. love, I love seeing them have their early. Yeah, we're totally fighting right now. This isn't flirting. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. Now, you had meant there's a bunch of stuff in this issue that you caught that I did not. And one of the things was you said something about Chris jo- Christopher Jones put in a bunch of Minneapolis jokes. <laughs> <laughs> not not jokes necessarily, but we did. Okay. We, we joked about, we're like, why is this set in Minneapolis? Uh, yeah. I... I can't know for sure why it's set in Minneapolis, but... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I have nothing against <laughs> Minneapolis. It's just that yeah. you never hear... It's always San Francisco Cisco. or Los, or Vegas or Los Angeles or, or New York. You know, it's Gotham. <laughs> Anywhere and big. Right. <laughs> Minneapolis is a very specific yeah. but you know, city for this. Christopher Jones ran with it. And while I don't know most, most of the things, he did include various like landmarks and things in, mm. in like being in the streets because I believe Christopher Jones lives somewhere near Minneapolis or does a lot of things oh. there because he also threw in a couple of references to Convergence, which is a con that he co-founded right. a while back and still He talked about to. that in his, uh, in, in when he came on the show to talk to us, actually. That's so yeah. funny. Uh, like there's the only one that I know because he's pointed it out somewhere online is that there's somebody in the crowd who's wearing a T-shirt that has their robot mascot on it. <laughs> Uh, oh, I remember seeing that robot. Like he got he got to like design everybody's t-shirts and he was just like, let me just put this in here. Uh and That's I love it. It's funny. a fun little thing. And it's like it's like if somebody let you go off and like you get to we're setting this in a place that you know really well, you're just like, I'm just gonna put in all the little Easter eggs. <laughs> That's so funny. And then going from there, I do really love there's a little it's a little moment. It's only like one page and it's only a few lines of dialogue. Where Kid Flash says something about, like, can we hurry this up? I've got school tomorrow. Uh, And then they go off on a little back and forth thing between the three of them talking about, like, when school is starting or if they're already in school. And it's just really, it's like, it sounds weird to call it cute, but I think it is such a cute moment because we get to see them just be kids in the middle of a mission. And that just makes me happy because, like, being teenagers doesn't stop the second you put on the costume. You are still thinking about your math homework while you are fighting mm-hmm. a giant snake. The thing that I noticed in that scene was Artemis saying, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, really? Mine doesn't start for a week. And Robin says, no kidding? Mine too. <laughs> and I can't tell. I think Robin didn't know yet. Because oh, you think he didn't know? I- I'm not sure if he did or not. It would be really... Funny if he did, I guess. And maybe Batman told him. But I mean, it was supposed to be like she got into, you know, Gotham Academy because of a, a Wayne Corp thing. Yeah. Right. So maybe he didn't know until she got there or maybe he did. I don't know. But it's really kind of a funny moment, too. It's a it's a nice little moment, whether he knew or not. I like to think that he kind of always knew that there may have been some level of Batman being like, keep an eye out on her, like 
make sure everything's okay with her just because of everything, something like that, maybe. But I like the idea that Robin was told, like, you can't tell her who you are. So instead, he just tried to drop as many hints as possible to see if she would figure it out on her own. <laughs> I really like that headcanon that Robin is just just uh, want just like wants it. other people to figure out his secret identity so he doesn't have to tell them. Right. Just drop all of the jokes until Artemis is like, wait. Right. You're him. Right. I, right. And he's just like, Batman, I didn't tell her. She's I'm just smart. Her. She's Don't so work. I. It's not my fault. <laughs> and my last two things for this are in the I'm fascinated the by these. Thing. I'm just fascinated. Issue, <laughs> issue 17 just inexplicably has two different relatively specific theater jokes that aren't Shakespeare, which is a little surprising considering Greg Wiseman. But right. That I just, I need to talk about them. <laughs> so there is this random thing where the giant snake that uh, the the adult heroes are fighting goes off and attacks a theater in the middle of everything. It's just kind of attacking everything, but it ends up at a theater for a little while. And there is a guy in a scarf who's just supposed to be like your stereotypical theater hipster critic guy who runs out and is just ranting and is like, how does a giant snake have anything to do with a streetcar named Desire, which is the name of a play? And then later in that same fight, uh, I think it's Green Arrow, fires an arrow at yeah. it that explodes into fireworks for no Dis- apparent reason. Distri- <laughs> Dis- distracting the snake, I think. It's so. distracting the snake. And right. the same character drawn in the crowd goes, oh, now I get it. Snake plus fireworks totally streams, screams streetcar. Uh, I don't get it. And when reading this... <laughs> And when reading this, I'm like, I understand that this is probably just supposed to be a joke about how theater people are weird and pretentious. And yeah, sometimes we are. Mm -hmm. I say this as a theater major who's been doing theater most of my life. We say weird stuff like this, Mm -hmm. but there is some level, as someone who has read and watched this show in an academic setting... You could make the claim that in some weird experimental way, these two things could be connected since Streetcar Named Desire, without going into any of the not very G-rated plot, is a show about gender politics and power and repression and a bunch of other stuff. And it's largely about like a weird, like, I'm trying to think of how I'm trying to explain this, (laughs) um, it's largely about a weird level of passion and tension in a very violent situation. So you can make the claim through Mm -hmm. a very pretentious theater person lens of, sure, this could be connected in some weird experimental theater where you were probably doing like 10 other crazy things. If someone like gave me a staging of Streetcar Named Desire that somehow ended up with a giant snake and fireworks on stage, I'd be like, that's crazy, but you may be onto something. <laughs> I'm going to have to trust you on this one. Just going to have to do that. Oh, give me, give me all classic theater, but with superhero battles. Right. Because the only thing I picture is Marlon Brando in a t shirt. Screaming, screaming, screaming Stella. Yes, it is that. Yeah. It's that one. Um, which, yeah, it's weird. It's a weird show, but all all theater is weird on some level. Just, yeah, feel free to cut my ranting. Because, like, no, no this is good. Because like, I want to hear the next one too. Because I didn't get this one either. <laughs> this one, this one is so. This one is so stupidly specific, and I'm pretty sure this was not an intentional joke. But I'm gonna say it is because it makes me laugh if it was if this okay. was the most subtle joke anybody ever came up with there is a moment in this big fight where uh kid flash i think it is kid flash or robin one of them uh goes and attacks uh cobra and says your god spell is broken uh and cobra responds with truly you are a clown Oh, okay. okay. Normal villain insult. Normal, normal, wi- normal <laughs> communication. Right, sure. Uh, but Godspell <laughs> is spelled as one word, right? Which is weird and not how you would generally do that ever, like in writing. Okay. So maybe it's just a typo. Somebody messed up. Somebody just didn't put a space in. Okay. But there's also a musical called Godspell, right? Uh, and it's a musical that is essentially 
the new the New Testament of the Bible, but set in modern times, told through song. It's a musical. I've been in it. It's a fun show. And I was like, wow, it's I like first I brushed off. I was like, wow, it's weird that the you took out one space and now this is the name of a musical. But the following line is truly you are a clown. And in Godspell, most stagings of it, the original staging of it on Broadway, the film adaptation of it, and most revivals of it have all of the characters in it wearing clown makeup of some form. Okay. You, you stare please at me see, like I'm crazy. Please see previous conversation about being weird. <laughs> Theater is weird. Right. It is, it's meant in the show, it is meant as... It's not like full on. You don't do your full face in clown makeup generally. It's sm- it's face paint. Okay. But there is supposed to be a level of circus happening in the in the group that is on stage. You do a lot of you do a lot of weird stuff. You do a lot of weird whatever skills your group has essentially when you do Godspell. Literally, when I did Godspell, one of the things on the audition form was like what random things can you do? And like we had people who spoke different languages, people who knew specific kinds of dance or acrobatics. And we're like, we're just going to put that in the show because that's how this show works. And part of the clown makeup concept is that the character who is supposed to be Jesus when he arrives on stage, because it's just, it's he's named Jesus. It's literally just the New Testament. Okay. It's about Jesus and the apostles. I'm waiting to um, see where the connection between clowns and Jesus comes. Part of it is when Jesus comes on, one of the things that happens is everyone on stage has a very quick change where once they are like baptized into being one of Jesus' apostles, goes from wearing dark clothing to wearing bright clothing. Uh, and-, and part of that is that Jesus marks everyone with some symbol of clown makeup somewhere on their face. And generally everyone has a unique thing and you figure it out beforehand and you all put makeup on each other and it's a whole thing. My production didn't do this, but most productions do. And it's a level of being able to go. Everyone is a community. We are all connected to each other. This is our in-universe mark of connection that identifies all of us as part of this group. Interesting. And it's generally labeled as clown makeup that is then... By the end of the show, by the time the whole arc of the show has gone on during what is essentially the last supper in the show, is everyone has it wiped off. Everyone wipes it off together and becomes a whole different community. And it's a whole thing. It's all very interesting and it's all very interesting staging and it's great storytelling. That's cool. But (laughs) after this little theater rant, coming back to all of this, the fact that they followed up a line in which they spelled Godspell as Godspell one word with a reference to clowns is probably just a typo and is probably just me I'm not, overthinking I'm convinced things, it's a typo but at this it's, point. <laughs> I'm very convincing. But it's if it's not, it is the most subtle, specific theater joke I have ever read in put, anything. I don't put it past them, though. I just don't. There's so many subtle things that never get explored that get dropped in the background. Like we don't get an explanation of the Xionizer blade. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but like but it's like that's part of like DC canon and they can assume that like the overlap of people who yeah, like DC fair. canon and the people reading Young Justice are probably is probably a decent number that they can drop that easter egg. This is like what's our overlap between people who read and watch Young Justice and people who have a weirdly in-depth knowledge of Godspell. <laughs> Oh, it's it three two, people? Two with the audience. I think it's, what's the Venn diagram? The Venn diagram is apparently Greg Weissman or Kevin Ops. And <laughs> me. And you. And maybe friend of the show, Richard Kreutz Landry. I don't know. Gwen Wilson. If it was, in- if it was I intentional, know. I got the joke. If it wasn't intentional, <laughs> right. I'm thinking too much about your work. And I apologize, but also <laughs> you got a theater lesson out of it. So have fun, kids. I'm fascinated. Now I want to go see Godspell because I was like, how is this with the clowns? I don't, what? Okay, it's a g- I got it. It's a good show and it the film I've adaptation heard- is okay, but it works better on stage because then like theater's cool that way and you get live interaction. It's great. Okay. Cool. It was well, my have- freshman year high school show, and we had so much fun. We won an award for best ensemble. Wow. Let me just hit my microphone. A few more What's times. What's wow? A freshman year. Okay. Wow. My I'm, freshman year a, high school show. My eighth grade theater 
presentation was me as the lead in It's Cold in Them Thar Hills. So <laughs> I'm thinking, in thinking what, you had a you had a little bit more more theater going on than I did. What? I played Paw. <laughs> What is? <laughs> I think it killed him. What? <laughs> James Tricasso knew what I was talking about. <laughs> I've never heard of this show. Mm, you should go look it up. <laughs> you got a theater lesson in this. <sighs> Breathe, Emily. I'm dying. I'm dying. You just <laughs> said that so casually. Titles that have a built-in accent are always weird titles. Yes. Welcome to my childhood. <laughs> I'm fine. You probably have some notes about things that you like. I do, and most of them are ridiculous. They're ridiculous and less deep than you than yours, I think. Maybe. I don't know. My first one's pretty deep. I like how the evil twin is clean shaven and the good twin has a goatee. <laughs> that's that's pretty that, that was that was oh, pretty reversing stereotypes. <laughs> that's pretty, they're just shattering the mold. Uh yeah, Left I was so right. pretty thought that was pretty funny. Uh you know, yeah, I didn't really notice it when they were kidnapping him, but he's laying on the table. I was like, "Wait. <laughs> he's got a goatee." Well, we don't know much about either of them. Maybe he really is the evil twin. <laughs> well, he actually does become Cobra in the comics at some point later <laughs> on, but you know, that's the way it goes. Season 5, man, season 5. <laughs> right, exactly. Cuz we know so much about the original Cobra right now. Yeah, I think in the comics they were um they were uh, attached as well. They were like Siamese twins that were separated and that kind of thing. So, it's interesting. Okay then. Yeah, it was it, it's odd. Anyway, <laughs> I loved I loved Barry's line, uh kid, I was a CSI before anyone knew what a CSI was, which makes me I love that line super too. happy actually cuz it's totally true cuz he was a he was a police Forensic investigator back in the '60s, yeah. which was awesome, um, and we don't get to see very much of that. And there are characters in the DC universe that have really interesting backgrounds, or like, you know, the the second best detective in the DC universe is uh, Ralph Dibney, the Elongated Man, and he used to team up with Barry all the time. So Barry's got all this forensic, literally forensic trained knowledge that Batman uses. I love how Barry uses forensics to track down where they're going in this issue, but Batman just does something super creepy to that guy. I don't know what's going on. You just, there's like, I don't know. I was like, it's, you, got, you got all like vampire on this dude. Like it was a little uh, disturbing. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the, what the script directions were for what to draw there. It's just like be menacing. I'm I, like, Ugh. there was, God, I cannot remember what episode it was. I think it was um I think it was Batman Beyond. Batman, I think it was Batman and maybe Terry McGinnis and Superman are on a roof. Oh god, I'm gonna figure out what it was. Anyway, Batman goes over like this this guy is not gonna talk. Whatever's going on is not gonna talk. And Bruce just walks over to the guy and like whispers in his ear. And then the guy starts talking, like for, just starts talking. And I think it's Terry turns to to Clark and says, "What did he say?" And Clark's all, "You don't want to know." And then, then that's all there is. God, okay, if anybody remembers what episode of Justice League that was, or or Batman Beyond, or Batman the Animated Series, please tell me what it was because I want to go watch that again. I just remember, I remember, I thought I remember Bruce handing somebody his cane as he went over there too. So I think it was Batman Beyond. I can't remember. It was so funny. Funny in not a funny way. Funny in a very Bruce way. Um, <laughs> I also there's all these little things that like Robin says mostly, but like <laughs> Robin's all <laughs> he says <laughs> or quick or like now while Cobra basks. I was like, wow, there's some double entendre going on in there. Like it's, basks, he's a big snake. Basks yeah. in the sun. Super villain basking in his glory. Like I was like, okay, that was cute. He also calls him Cobra Mort instead of Voldemort, which I thought was pretty funny too. I love, I love that it's Kid Flash who, who says that. Who says Cobra Mort? Oh, is it? Oh, I thought it was Robin. I just flipped it open, and it's it's a little unclear, but I think it's Kid Flash. It's kind of either one. Kid Flash. Either one works. And it, 
it amuses me because Kid Flash also, one, hates magic, but at the same time in the episode oh, with right. uh, Kent Nelson says that uh, Kent Nelson Dumbledores it up to... Oh, that's right. Oh, so, so now we know that Wally is a Harry Potter fan. <laughs> right. But like, you know, the novels are cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. 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 Exactly. Um, I loved the teamwork thing where Robin just tosses Kid Flash like a gas pellet. He doesn't say anything. Like, it's like a thing that they've done, which I want to see. That's so cool, where he throws him the gas pellet. Kid Flash runs at Mammoth, throws, like, super speed throws the pellet into uh, Mammoth's mouth. Because why would Mammoth expect Kid Flash to have something like that? And then knocks him unconscious. I was like, that was that was rad. <laughs> that was so good. And Kid Flash and Robin had worked together before in the past, right? So I, even at this point. So I want to see more of that. That was rad. Yeah. It's a great little moment. I also I just want to throw this out there before you have before we end this on like a note that makes sense. I had another I had another revelation about the Godspell thing. Oh, please. <laughs> Cuz I realized cuz I I opened up a tab real quick to be like I wanted to see if I could find a a picture to like send you that would make sense of like this is what people look like when they do the show and was reminded when I did that that the film adaptation and thus a lot of stage adaptations of this musical have the character who is supposed to be Jesus wear a Superman shirt. Uh, and that is a thing that has become ingrained in the imagery of this show. Uh... I've killed Rich with my really weird theater knowledge. What? Yep. I'm going to have to see this show just so I can get this joke. <laughs> it's, it's, such a, like, it's such a silly specific joke. But like... It is a thing, and not every production does it, and a lot of the time in more more modern adaptations, people try to kind of like, we're not just like the film, so they try to move away from that and not put their Jesus character in a Superman shirt, but the film made it kind of iconic, so some productions still do it, uh, and it's because like in modern, in modern comics and in modern understanding of comics, Superman is largely seen as a Christ figure in a lot of ways, just because... Because he is that sort of all-powerful, benevolent thing that people like to frame him as. Jor-El so, sent like, his only son to Earth to protect humans? I don't understand the parallel. Yeah, where where would people ever get this parallel from? No idea. But, uh, yeah, so that's just another little little level of, like... Interesting. I might I'm gonna not have to see be this. completely crazy. <laughs> I promise I I'm not cra- completely crazy. I have, like, a hundred episodes of my crazy theories. This is awesome. I love this because I would not have been able to. I was like, there's this something about this God spell thing. There's something about because I'd heard of the play and I was like, that's interesting. And I was like, and streetcar named I've seen streetcar named desire. I have <laughs> no idea what the snake and firework thing is. <laughs> Like, that is a stretch and is probably intended to just be a joke about pretentious theater talk. And, like, I know. I've seen pretentious theater. I have interacted (laughs) with people who are like, look at this experimental show. The potatoes symbolize humanity. Right. Like, I've been to that show, guys. Have you seen Coco? No. Oh, my God. You need to see Coco. I know. I need to see Coco. You need to see Coco. But there's there's a moment where Coco is talking to... um, Oh God! Her name just went right out of my head. She's got the unibrow. She's like Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo. Thank you. So there's one point. There's one point where um, now I forgot his name. Oh my God! <laughs> Hold on. This You're is the terrible. one who's seen the movie. I have. I've seen it several times. But Coco isn't the name of the main character. And so I keep when I think Coco, I until I saw the movie, I thought that was his name. And so it's not. It's the name of his great grandmother, and it's a very complicated, amazing, tear jerking, incredible story. Um, I just, oh yeah, it's so good. Um, uh, Miguel, Miguel is the little boy. Okay, so in Coco is one point where Miguel is talking to Frida Kahlo, and Frida Kahlo is like putting on this, you know, afterlife show, and she's like, it's bizarre, like. All the dancers come on stage, and they're all me. And they're crawling around the cactus, which is also me. And they're drinking cactus water as milk. 
from the milk of their mother, who is me. And she's like, she's it's so funny. And she looks at Miguel and she's like, is it too obvious or not obvious enough? And he just looks at her and goes, it's the right amount of obvious? <laughs> yeah, it was so good. Barring my really like, bad Frito Kahlo accent. Sorry about that. So like, the thing is, people always make these jokes about like weird theater. <laughs> but like... The only reason they work is because they're still true. People are still making theater pieces that are that weird. And at one point she goes, and everything is on fire. And then the like, fire <laughs> just starts exploding. It's so, it's the look on me. It's, it's so funny. I am having like uh. war flashbacks to weird experimental theater that I've seen because of my major. That I've had so to sit good. there and be like, uh. I, yeah, I, I get it. I know it's, I a, to- it's a total I totally tangent, get but it. Coco is brilliant. You got to see it. It's so good. I will. I yeah, will. I love that but movie. But like, we probably have a couple more notes on Young Justice. We I have one about. note. I have one more note. So we'll pull it back. This is we'll, why we'll I ground did this. It. I, this is why. <laughs> we'll ground it with one last note. I wanted to make sure we note, had something to end on. <laughs> which is not like, terribly important. But we do actually hear Batman at the end say, you know, there's a cell ready for Mammoth and Shimmer at Bell Rev. And... I'm pretty sure I remember seeing Mammoth in Bell Rev. So yeah. he uh, and Block- I'm pretty Blockbuster. Sure Shimmer too. Yeah. And he and Blockbuster were the two that I think were shattering the wall as they were freezing it. And yeah. so this is just how, because it's one of those things where you're like, wait, Mammoth got, wait, did Mammoth get into, did they capture Mammoth? Did they not capture Mammoth? Like in the show, you're not yeah. sure, but it's like, no, this is how Mammoth got into Bell Rev. And you were saying that this was just a few weeks before Terrors, right? Yeah, it's a couple of days before terrorists. Oh, okay, so he had literally just gotten there. And so it's important for I guess maybe Batman to say like, no, we have a we have a cell ready for him. Like he's not going to trial. He's going to Bell Rev, right? Like I guess they're just skipping all of the like Judas prudence. But like if you literally catch a known supervillain in the act of right. being a supervillain, how does the court case know. for that work? I don't know. By a vigilante? I just, I'm not really sure how that works <laughs> exactly. How does due process work in a world with superheroes? These are the Let's real ask. questions. <laughs> Give me my law and order superhero oh, division. Oh, then you should definitely read Powers. That should be our artistic license right there. <laughs> Powers is fantastic. It's about normal cops in a superhero universe. If you haven't read it yet, it's really good. So it's it's what you always argue Gotham should have been? Oh, you know, Gotham should totally have been that. Actually, Gotham should have just not been what it was. Sorry. Sorry for people who like Gotham. <laughs> I I'm just a, wanted I'm not a my fan. tiny bat cat rom-com, and that's I not know. what they gave me. No, I we know. We both I wanted very different shows. We did. I wanted it to be, yeah, I didn't need all the extra supervillains and the Batman stuff, you know, so it's but, okay. That's all right. I wanted it to be that. But anyway, tangent. Powers is really good. Yeah. We should probably move on to artistic license after all of these tangents. That's right. This go, episode's going to go be like two hours powers. long. Go look up powers and go, that was really good. But now we'll do our actual artistic license. Cool, cool. Have all four sidekicks ever been in the same place at the same time? Don't call us sidekicks. In artistic license, we'll be recommending individual issues, miniseries, and graphic novel collections, both from DC and other companies who have titles we think Young Justice fans will enjoy. Artistic License is designed to give you an on-ramp into the classic story arcs of the past so you might catch a glimpse of what's to come in the future. There, there, isn't, the, there's, there isn't much in this particular po- couple of issues that jumped out at me that might be something that we could call back to with the exception of the fact that Cobra's in it. And technically, Cobra, there was an era of DC Comics history where, I don't know if this is actually what happened, like the discussion in the bullpen, but what it, I, I'm, I, what it feels like happened was DC was like, Everybody gets a comic. Let's see what see what happens. <laughs> and so there was like this DC Comics explosion where like Cobra had his own series and it was just this very strange dynamic between his brother and him where in the comics they're twins that were they're Siamese twins that were separated at birth. Is that even the right term? I don't even know. Conjoined they're separate twins. What's that? Conjoined twins. Thank you. They were separated at birth and then, but they had the whole psychic twin trope thing where they could feel each other's pain. So twin they telepathy. Could, right. So he was like the best villain for, or the best antagonist to Cobra's protagonist. I don't think that was what was happening. Other way around. But they couldn't kill him because then they would kill their leader and like this kind of stuff. It was really weird. It was bizarre. 
That's not our artistic license. Our artistic license is a story arc for The Flash, actually, which is called Terminal Velocity, which had Cobra. It was kind of the main villain through that arc. Um, also, it was written by Mark Wade, who everybody at this point knows is one of my favorite writers of all time. It was a six-story arc that started right after uh, the Flash Zero Hour issue zero that I've talked about several times on the show. That was my favorite. It's my favorite Wally West story ever. It's the Wally West story that made me love Wally West. But right after that issue zero special, there was uh, the Flash Volume 2 issue 95 through 100 was the Terminal Velocity story arc. And in that in the, in that arc it is what introduces the concept of the Speed Force for the first time, which was not a thing before then. Uh, and Cobra is actually the central villain. And then about, then, you know, seven, eight issues later, I think it's, yeah, it's issue 108. After that, there's another arc called Dead Heat um, that goes on for six issues as well. That's excellent. That also kind of ties into the Speed Force and what it is. And the character of Savitar is introduced there, who I think, if I understand correctly, is the villain for the third season of The Flash. So, so these are the issues that give us the reason that we all hope Wally West isn't dead. Yes, except I have seen except. several things where Greg has said that he is does not understand the speed force, does not it doesn't feel like it's a thing. But we have hope. We do have hope because really it was the speed force. <clears throat> I talked about this a little bit in our Kid Flash Secret Origins, but it's the speed force that took Wally in the comics. Well, it wasn't really the speed force, but like <laughs> it was kind of this excuse to upgrade Wally's powers even more, right? So yeah. he went from not having the powers, then Barry dies, and he had this complicated psychological block thing about upgrading his powers to when he was an adult. Since he got his powers when he was younger and Barry didn't, his metabolism was trying to kill him. There was all this complicated stuff. Go listen to our Kid Flash Secret Orders. <laughs> but then uh, it gets upgraded again, and this is where he starts gaining crazy powers, like being able to instill you know, speed and momentum into other people. When he vibrates through objects, uh, they blow up because they've, you know, he can't, he's using the speed force to do it. Some other stuff is going on. It's crazy. But uh, Dead Heat, uh, really, really good. And then Terminal Velocity. And we'll have, we'll have links to the Terminal Velocity um, collection on Comixology on our website. Of course, you can always go to your friendly local comic store. And I highly recommend you do that to pick up the compilations as well. I want to give a quick shout out to, to um, when I was doing some research for kind of which comic to talk about. Uh, I stumbled on a pretty great video from watchmojo.com. It's yeah. watchmojo.com, which I had never seen before. We'll put a link to in the show notes here. They've got a great like story arcs that you can jump into the flash without having to know a lot from the past. Um, and it's really good. I watched the, watched the video. It's maybe nine minutes, 10 minutes, something like that. And all the comics they're talking about in there are fantastic. So you can go check out more work. There. They do. They do a lot of those videos. Cool. I'd never seen them before, so they're high quality and and it was good. It was solid. Uh, well, I, I, with that, I think we can wrap up this uh, mission into theater history and <laughs> head out of the Watchtower. The best way to support the show is to, of course, share it with a friend. You can also support us with five star reviews on Apple Podcast or your podcatcher of choice. Leaving a rating or review pushes us up in the search ranks and helps other people find the show. I also want to make a quick note that um, Neil and Webmaster Ryan have been working, and uh, in addition to being now on YouTube, where you can stream all of our stuff, we will also soon be on iHeartRadio and on Spotify. You can find us there as well. Uh, I forgot to put that at the head of the show. Expand in our reach. Yeah, you can find us everywhere. <laughs> Please continue to hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology and buy the show somewhere online until that DC streaming service launches soon. Soon. Hopefully. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. You can also now use hashtag Young Justice Outsiders when talking about season three online. And if you want to help us get more episodes, more secret origins, more actual play podcasts, and more of all of the other awesome stuff that we do, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us do even more with the show while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. 
Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.